Good morning. My name is Howie Granite, and I'm the Director of Business Development with the Inventus Power. And um, here with. And I'm Ilyas Ayub, uh, Head of Engineering for Inventus Power. And today we're going to speak about battery backup solutions, some of the options, advancements, and safety involved with those particular packs and designs. So a battery backup unit, or a BBU as we term it, are designed for intermittent power interrupts for systems, and some of them will support minor power interrupts, anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds, and then some of the more sophisticated or larger scale ones will be able to support a graceful shutdown. And each one of them is designed to ensure data integrity. And in the case of a graceful shutdown, an easy launching system once a regular power is, installed, is restored. In a BBU solution, there are many options that the system architect has to weigh and consider <clears throat> when he makes or she makes that decision as to how the battery backup is going to support the system. Now, in many solutions, including today's on-premises, uh, UPS is pretty much a, a common way of getting your battery backup, and that's an uninterruptible power supply. However, <clears throat> you may have certain systems out there, and this is heavily used in a data storage application, that you may have a BBU module actually on board uh, that data storage blade or as part of that system. There's also a lot of new solutions out there that are modular power supply units that offer battery backup as an option in one of those power supply unit shelves. So there's a couple of different power ranges that you'll traditionally see in each one of these type of applications where the onboard of the blade server is only supporting that blade, maybe one U, maybe two U high. That may be 100 or 200 watts of power. Power shelf system, though, could be anywhere from that 100, 200 watts up to 3 kilowatts per blade or module in that type of option. And a UPS, at least in, in our regards, to single phase, 12 or 48 volt, might be anywhere from 1.5 kilowatts to 3 kilowatts. Those are all scalable depending on how much power is required for that system or how much runtime is needed. So if we take a look at a virtualized system, as I'm showing here. Essentially, you can get battery backup in each one of these particular modules with the exception of the network switch. And that is, again, part of the challenge for the system architect to determine what are the concerns with the amount of runtime required, the latency issues within the system, what type of voltages, and you know what is the power architecture already in that system. So what you don't want to do is be redundant if you don't need to, but essentially when you get a clean sheet of paper, you have to make that decision where do you want battery backup to reside. So I'm going to toss it over to Ilias to continue the conversation about the design. Thank you, Howie. Um, so before we talk about design options for a backup battery, let's discuss some of the unique challenges that we encounter with batteries for data storage applications. Typically, BBUs have a very long calendar life requirements. Usually, it starts out with two years in storage at elevated temperatures, and then five years operational. So we need to find cells that can survive that long, still provide enough energy to handle a backup event uh, at the end of its life. BBUs also require very high output power. Some fire hose dumps can require up to five kilowatts of power from one BBU. As we search for cells, we will need to find cells that are designed to handle that much power. And two of the worst things that we can do to a lithium ion battery is to keep it fully charged and keep it at an elevated temperature. And guess what? That is exactly what happens with BBUs. BBUs are kept fully charged, ready to go, so, so they're ready to handle a backup event at any time, and they're in a very high temperature environment. Again, the cell selection is very critical to find which cells can handle this extreme requirements. Another big issue with BBUs is is the ability to have accurate state of charge and state of health data. Most fuel gauges require discharge and charge cycles to keep it accurate. Since BBUs are not being discharged often, the fuel gauge can become stale. So we need to find ways to periodically do partial discharges while, while still be ready to handle a backup event. 
this may require BBUs to have extra capacity so we can do these partial discharges and still support a backup event. Thermal mitigation is also a big design challenge considering that we are in a very hot envir ambient environment and the, the pack is outputting a very high discharge output. We need to make sure we're not overstressing the electrical components and cells beyond their temperature limits. Most critical is a cell. Most lithium cells are spec to a max of 80 Celsius for skin temperature, including overshoot. And if you start at an ambient of 50 Celsius, you only have a 30 C margin, which is not very big considering the amount of discharge power that's coming from the BBU. So we need to look at component selection, mechanical design, and software design to actually manage the, the heat. We also need to understand how to design the pack to ensure that we don't have a thermal runaway. We need to make sure if a cell experiences an issue that it doesn't propagate to the rest of the battery. So we, gotta, we need to add mitigation to prevent that. There are also many regulatory items that we need to account for in the design to pass some of the, some of the standards. Here's the next slide. So within lithium ion chemistry, there are many options to choose from. Some of them will work for BBUs and some of them will not. Lithium cobalt is a very high energy density chemistry and was used primarily for laptops and cell phones. The issue with this chemistry is that it has a very low power density and it is not as safe as the other chemistries. This solution is actually not recommended for BBU use. Most preferred option is the NMC or NCA technology for BBUs. They offer a good energy density and power density. These types of cells are commonly used in power tools. Iron phosphate, or LFP, can also be a good option for BBUs. They offer very high power density, is one of the safest lithium technology, and they can handle high temperature excursions. But their big drawback is low energy density and higher costs. But with the additional safety and thermal mitigations you have to add to the other chemistries to keep them safe, a total LFP BBU solution is coming very close to the cost of an NMC or NCA solution. And with the recent advancements in LFP technology bringing the cost down, LFP can still be a very viable solution for BBUs. One of the critical design elements for BBUs is finding cells that can, uh, can provide high power. This is an example of a discharge curve for a very high rate, an 18650 NCA cell. It can provide up to 30 amps continuously for the duration. And as you can see in the graph, the temperature rises very quickly. Um, so we need to find cells that are very low impedance so they don't generate a lot of self-heating. We also have to ensure we have heat mitigation features in the BBU, such as heat sinking, fans, or active cooling. Uh, the key is to ensure that we keep the skin temperature of the cell to be below 80 C at the end of its life after a full discharge. The next couple of slides shows roadmaps of different cells for BBUs. Um, so you want to try to pick cells from the pink region as they offer high power density cells. As you can see, we pretty much hit the wall with high rate 18650s at about 3 amp hours. Typically, energy density is not too much of a concern for BBUs. It is typically the power density that becomes a driving factor on which cell and how many cells we need to use. Here's the next if you want, if you need higher than three amp hours or 35 amps uh, current capability, then we need to start looking at the 21700 7, 21, cells. This is the new class of cells that started several years ago, made famous by Tesla. These cells are used in the Tesla Model 3. Uh, with these cells, we can get close to 50 amp output from one cell and around four amp hours of capacity. Uh, the biggest recommendations we give to customers is to design the BBU to be able to handle both to 21700 and 18650 cell geometry. They, this gives us the ability to switch between, between them and makes it uh, future-proof. Um, this, this shows the roadmap of where the LF, LFP or uh, iron phosphate cells are. Uh, the best high rate is about 50 amps current capability and about two and a half amp hour capacity. Uh, in the cylindrical form factor, there are two form factors, 18650 and then 26650. Uh, if you go higher than two amp hour capacity, uh, you're looking at a 26650 form factor uh, for these cells. So safety is a, a big aspect of the BBU design. 
it starts with cell selection and ensuring we pick a cell that is from a reputable vendor and has a long history. We also trust but verify the performance of the cell by running testing at elevated temperatures for years. Some of our VBU cells have been on test for more than five years at different temperatures to understand the performance over that span of time. Uh, another thing we do to ensure you know, more safety within the BBU is we reduce the charge voltage on non-lithium iron phosphate cells. Uh, lowering the charge voltage extends the life of the cell and also increases the safety factor. And then to ensure proper thermal, thermal propagation design mitigation, we apply gaps between cells and use thermal barriers to prevent heat from one cell affecting the neighboring cell. If you go to the next slide, every BBU will have a, a BMS, uh, it's a battery management system. This system will provide the following features. It will monitor voltage, current, and temperature of the cells to ensure they're within normal limits. And if they exceed those limits, it will shut down the battery. It will also ensure our cells are properly balanced. Um, if they go out of balance, it will slowly start cell balancing and try to ensure all the cell strings have the same voltage. The BMS will also provide state of charge readings, so the end application knows how much capacity is left on the battery. Uh, this is typically communicated over a communication bus, uh, such as I squared C, SM bus, or CAN bus. And then typically there will also be redundant protection features on the BMS, uh, such as secondary over voltage protection and current fuses. Um, there are also a lot of mechanical des mechanical design elements that go into a BBU. Uh, we need to ensure proper cell spacing between cells to ensure to prevent thermal propagation and heat transfer. Uh, we also employ wire bonding to ensure each cell is fused on both end. And in, in case a cell fails, we can quickly disconnect that cell from the rest of the pack. We also look at mechanical enclosure uh, material to prevent any fire leak. Typically, we'll use some sort of sheet metal, but plastic is also an option uh, as long as it is a V0 rating. Uh, the goal is to ensure that the project doesn't fail, but if it does fail, then it fails safe. Um, there are a lot of regulations around the world that are tied to batteries, uh, and in the past it was typically UL 2054 and IEC 62133, but now as new applications are coming forward, that are employing lithium batteries, many new standards are starting to pop up that are specific to those applications. And one common test that is new from previous standards is this thermal runaway test. The test procedure calls out that one of the lithium ion cells to artificially be put in a thermal runaway. The test tries to ensure that the complete pack doesn't go into a thermal runaway and fire doesn't escape the case. Again, this is to ensure if a lithium ion cell fails, it feels safe and it doesn't take out the whole battery. Thank you, Elias. Appreciate your time going through the different technologies involved in the BBU design and manufacture. So I'm gonna go through a couple of items that we've been working on within the open compute community. And the first one being the open edge proposal. The BBU solution we're showing here is for the uh, 3U high, 19 inch wide uh, edge computing uh, product <clears throat> that was started by the Nokia uh, organization. And we're looking at a battery pack that will support a five to eight minute runtime for far edge applications where the uh, power source is unreliable. <clears throat> it's a 1.6 kilowatt battery pack, which is putting out 12 volts of regulated current at 133 amps. And it's a fairly wide temperature range of operation from minus 5 to 60 C discharge. We do have in the future plans to have something that's going to be able to support an even wider temperature range. This is a full feature battery backup unit with a BMS that incorporates the protection as Ilias had gone through, fuel gauging, onboard charging, it's using SM bus communication, and it's designed for a five-year-plus life at about 600-plus cycles. And that's kind of important when you're putting it in an installation that has inconsistent power. 
We're also, <clears throat> because of that, using a fanless design to increase the MTBF of this product. And we do expect to have prototypes roughly uh, late this year with the base current environment, maybe early in 2021. And we do plan on um, submitting this to the OCP community. On a slightly larger level, we have the Open Rack version 3 proposal, which is going through development right now. And it's an 18 kilowatt total system power solution in a 2U high 21 inch wide chassis. And this particular solution is broken down into six modules. And it also incorporates a shelf management controller, very similar to that of the power supply unit. That's part of the Open Rack version 3 uh, power design. <clears throat> Each one of these modules is at 48 volt and will support a 60 amp discharge. The actual regulation, however, is on a different module that the battery backup unit will plug into that supports the charging and the discharging at that uh, 48 volt plus or minus 1% uh, output. It's a 2U high, it's an open U um, height and roughly 520 millimeters deep and it supports five minutes of runtime. And not only is this BBU module parallel stackable within the 2U high chassis as you see here, but also within the actual system itself. So depending on the amount of runtime that you need or that overall chassis, you can run multiple uh, 2U high uh, solutions. Uh, similar to the Open Edge product, we're looking at tail end of this year, early 2021, and we'll be planning on submitting this to the OCP community. So this wraps up the technical part of our presentation. And what I'd like to do is at least ask the community to please um, let us know about some of your different ideas of how these BBUs can be used. Always good to hear about specific end applications to ensure that our designs can support it. And, you know, let's also make sure that you add information about the thermal management. As you can now understand, it's very critical to the, uh, the system efficiency and specifically the battery. And we are participating in the Telco and Edge subproject as well as the Rack and Power. So I'm going to open the session up to questions now. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening in to our presentation. It looks like we have one question so far in regards to the NFPA IFC 855 code. So, Elias, would you like to take that question, please? Sure. Um, I mean, I would need to look into uh, more details um, on that requirement and see if there's any concerns with that code. Uh, for our BBUs. I do believe that that may tie in with the, <clears throat> uh, I think it's the 9540A and having to do with the distancing between uh, chassis and systems. And if, if that is the case, I believe that it goes into the design of the pack with gaps in between the cells and doing the testing, uh, such as against the UL 1973 certifications. And a lot of the design will be based on achieving uh, that particular requirement. And then we also have another question regarding uh, ORV3. Um, concept and if, it, if it's a fanless design. Um, currently, we do have a provision uh, for a fan in the, uh, in the BBU module. Um, as we run more testing and understand the thermal performance of the, of the pack, uh, we can determine if we actually will need the fan or not. 
but currently it, uh, it's, it, there is a provision for expanding them. Sure, and to add to that, there is a revision in the concept uh, since Ilias and I recorded this presentation where it looks more like an integrated design with the charge and discharge module, so it may be all in one unit. And we are definitely doing the thermal analysis. It seems that the charge-discharge portion of it definitely needs more cooling. So we are working with our collaborative partner, uh, Artisan, on that to <clears throat> potentially have two fans in the design to be able to support the wide temperature range needed in this application. Okay. Elias, we also have a question about the charge and discharge circuit. And actually our teammate, Navid, who um, has been working on it, would probably be best to answer that. So we don't know if we can get him tied in uh, right away. But uh, the charging power yeah, so, will not I mean, be three. So the, go, go ahead on that, Elias. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, is the... Uh, uh, the charge and discharge circuit the same power uh, as three kilowatts. Uh, no, so the discharge is going to be three kilowatts. Um, the charge will be uh, considerably less than that. Uh, we're still determining what the charge current will be, um, but yeah, it will not be as same as the three kilowatt discharge power. And I don't know if there's, I don't think there's any more questions. Oh, there's a yet. Hang on. Oh, we do have another question on the chat. Um, it said, can you describe where the charge and discharge converter goes? Um, so as, um, as how we was talking about for our ORV3 proposal when we were first, when we recorded this, we were thinking of a, of a separate module uh, that would get attached to the end of the BBU that would do the, the DC to DC converter. Um, so, but we're, you know, you know, after that, there's discussions about maybe we need to incorporate that within the BBU itself. Um, so that's still uh, open for discussion on where that actually will reside. Yeah, one of, the, one of the challenges in this particular system is it's pretty, energy, it's pretty power dense. So the cells themselves take up, uh, you know, a fixed amount of space. And then we have essentially, I believe it's around 973 millimeters between the face plate and the bus bar. So what we're trying to do is work with Artisan in this case on coming up with a very compact power dense an efficient uh, charge discharge circuit that's going to fit in there. So when we balance out the space for the interconnect and the cabling and the fans, it's definitely a packaging challenge. And also working within the safety standards of those new certifications, which are going to force us to have a larger gap between the cells than maybe in packs of five or 10 years ago. And then we also had a question. Um, it would be good to have a selectable charge current, one through five amps. Yes, I mean, I mean that will, uh, we will be uh, on a uh, on the communication bus, uh, so we can um, set the charge current, and that, you know, there will be provision to, be, to have it selectable uh, within the, uh, the DDU. And Ilias, we also have a question about a fan in the BBU tied into the NFPA requirements. Do you have any insight into that? Uh, no, I would have to. I mean, we're, we're going to be looking into all that um, with our regulatory experts. 
um, to see, you know, if there's any, con any concerns with putting a fan uh, based on the NSPA requirements uh, in our BBUs. Okay. Well, we will definitely get back with you on that one. The um, question about <clears throat> cells and series, actually another thing that seems to be shifting as there are a number of different charge and discharge topologies that were being considered. At first, we were looking at this as a 48 volt nominal, and it would be a buck boost converter, but it seems that we are leaning now more towards a nominal 40, 42 volts, so it'll be a boost only. So at the moment, we're looking at a 12S6P configuration of the cell. Yeah, and that's being done to help with the efficiencies of our of the converter. Correct. Uh, we have another question that says, "What is a what is a procedure for locate and monitor potentially prob problematic cells in the DBU?" Um, so we, we do have a we're going to have a, a BMS um, circuitry in the BBU that will monitor the cell strings. Uh, that will also monitor the temperatures of the cells. Um, so if any of those, um, if the voltage is too, is too high or is in balance with the other cell strings or if the temperature is too high, uh, it will shut off the, uh, the BBU as a, a fail-safe mechanism. There's a question about 12 volt versus 48 volt, and which is more prominently used in the industry and why. Great question. What we have traditionally seen in the data market is the 12 volts as the more standard bus or backplane voltage. But in the telecom segment, it's been 48 volt for a very long time, minus 48 volt actually. And in our case, what we find is either one of them becomes relevant. We have a lot of customers that are using our onboard modules that are at 12 volts. And what we're seeing is more of the updated UPS solutions in single phase at 48 volts. For us, it, it does add a little bit more cost and complexity for the 48 volt just because of the number of cells in series and the balancing and the work that the BMS has to do, 12 volts a little bit easier. But on the other hand, the power circuitry components are obviously with 48 volts a little bit easier and lower cost. So we find it kind of balances out and allows us to have a more reasonable uh, discharge current out of the packs with the 48 volts. So yeah, I mean, as the, again, as we, the power, yeah, as the power requirements are going up and up for servers, um, it's easier to do, deal that deal with that with at 48 volts because then you can reduce the current, and then the I squared R losses um, can be managed, as opposed if you had to do it at the 12 volt voltage. And a question about locate pack level only. Actually, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe you can clarify on that. Oh, maybe it's in regards, <clears throat> Ilias, to uh, the earlier question about the procedure for locating and monitoring problematic cells in the BBU. Oh, about locate wrong cell. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not, we're not monitoring every single cell, cell in the pack um, you know, because that will, will overcomplicate the, the BMS. Um, we're, we're monitoring the, each individual string. So if we go with the 12S or a 14S, each of those strings will be monitored uh, for voltage. Uh, and if we detect that the voltage is too high or too low or out of balance with the rest of the, the other strings, uh, it will shut off the pack uh, as a safety precaution. 
Uh, and then, you know, a lot of our designs were moving to having fuses on each of the, the cells. Um, so if there is an issue with the cell, uh, the fuse can blow and uh, isolate itself from the rest of the, the BBU as well. All right. Well, it seems that we are <clears throat> down to one last question here as we wrap up the half hour session about the BBU ORV3 uh, boost discharger and buck charger, correct? So, Ilias, we're taking the 50 volts off of the bus for this and then bringing it in to charge the packs. So maybe you can just talk very quickly about that. Yeah, so I mean, I mean like, like how he says, you know, we're still, uh, you know, we're looking at either a 14S or a 12S, um, but if it's a 12S solution, we're going to boost up the voltage. Uh, and then from a, from a charging standpoint, yeah, we will buck the, the charger um, um, to charge our battery pack. Yeah, and the, the charging piece of it is, is usually going to be designed a little bit closer to the demand of the system as to if there's a multiple discharge requirement and also how fast that they need the battery to be able to recharge for another full event. Okay. And... Well, we're going a little bit into overtime, but Elias, do you want to answer this last question? Yep. Yeah, the, the question I'll read is, are you aware of any design guidelines that allows planning of energy loss and DC resistance over increase over past lifetime? Uh, this would be helpful in planning the design to meet the system's needs. Um, so uh, if you're talking about the cell impedance, uh, we do model the cell impedance and growth over time and over temperature. So, you know, as we discussed earlier in the presentation, we do have cells that are on test um, over a long period of time at different temperature. And so one of the things that we, you know, we get from the test is how the impedance is growing um, within the cell. Uh, so we do model that as we uh, determine uh, lifetime uh, Availability of capacity uh, for those for, for the BBU, uh, so we can we can determine what the what the end of end of five year discharge capacity will be. We will have modeled you know the impedance growth of that cell. Yeah. So in this case, for example, and with most of our UPS and and BBU designs, when we give a rated amount of time, it's at end of life. So in this case. We typically designed five years. In this case, from what I understand now, it's four year. So what will happen is that you'll get that five minutes at the end of life, but at the beginning of life, you're probably going to be looking at potentially 40 or 50 percent more runtime available at installation. So it's absolutely built into the uh, configuration of cells and how many we need. And you know, we do the independent modeling and testing of all the cells that we use and BBUs so that we can actually verify what we're going to be able to put out there as an expectation. I think, Howie, that's all the questions that we have, and I think we are over our lot of time. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for attending. And any questions, Ilias and I will be available throughout the rest of the afternoon at our booth. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.